very welcome indeed. This is the Power of Dreams and we are very excited today, aren't we, Porik? We are indeed very excited. Sorry I'm fighting off man flu here, but yeah, we're very excited. Oh, Porik, seriously, man flu. Does that even exist? It does indeed, and okay. I, I've soldiered on to come in here to be oh, on the show. So I'm fine. No, I'm great for him. I'm great for him. And cuddles and hugs for the rest of the day. Absolutely. I get mothered in here. <laughs> well, something like mothered with an S. Yay. <laughs> in studio today, guys, we have the amazing Mr. Brian Daly from Irish Web TV. Hi, Brian. Hi, Marion. Yeah, and the maverick, insatiably talented and creative Mr. Terry McMahon. How are you? All right. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> okay. What we need to do is just get our conversation on here with the man who actually live streamed for the first time in Ireland, Brian Daly. Tell us how did that even happen? How does somebody even come up with a concept like that in Ireland and then make it happen? Because you're well, very inspirational. Well, as a techie, as a techie, I um, identified that the, there was an emerging web TV market, so I gave up full time employment to get involved with it because um, it it meant that you could get more local content to the world and but. The way employment was going, the diaspora abroad, um, people were asking, when can I see it? And I could say, now. Brilliant. So you're live streaming things like football matches to anybody who might be from County Cavan or Meath or Dublin or whatever, across the world, to Irish people. Oh, well, initially I started in, in my home location of, of Cavan, but then identified that um, the market is there. So I registered all the, the 32 counties. So if there was some event taking place in like Dublin now, we could put on DublinCityTV.com or Belfast. As you did, the thing in Derry, we were able to go live out on Derry City uh, TV. We couldn't get com, so we got net. So it, it means that, that, that even local events, if people were fundraising, even local advertisers wanted to get to the local market, it means that, that they have instant access um, to a worldwide market. How difficult was it giving up a full-time job and then actually now at the moment, are there funds there for you to support this passion and also what you're doing for Irish people? How do you manage? No, well fortunately I had, um, I had 40 years full-time employment at that point and um, I had a retirement package from the, the HSE which I, I, I put in to, um, to get setting up the equipment. I got some support from the Enterprise Board as well um, and Cavan County Council. So it meant that, that I had a good base and as a techie then like it was easy peasy for me to, to set up studios as, as, as you saw when, when uh, of course uh, listeners have to let you know that Marion was a presenter on Ooh. live web TV at one point and um, she was viewable from all over the world and with very very positive comments as probably you Aww. know from listening to her on, on Dublin FM. Well listen here, you know what, I loved every moment of it as well because you gave me a chance which I really really appreciate because that's what I love doing and you're quite inspiring as a man because for me you stuck by every single person that came in that door because you had a studio based in Cavan at the time as well and that was you know, top end really as well, you had everything, you had a green screen, you had all the equipment so there was a lot of passion and time put in. So where are you at with everything right now? You have a few shows, don't you? Still airing? Yeah, oh, well, the, the basic format is still there. We had to scale back a little bit because um, getting finance to, to support the programming. We had six programs live every week and that type of production uh, it was very testing live, both on radio and, and television, is, is very demanding, um, both mentally and, and um, even physically, because you, ha you have to make sure that it has to work and, and that's it and um, so from a financial point of view it, it meant a lot of constraints and um, that the, 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 the money just simply wasn't coming in from advertising now it's, it's emerging but it didn't emerge um, in time so I had to scale it back we're doing post-production work now all right, post production because you set up <coughs> around 2008 was it just at the, just when the crash happened at the time when you talk about <coughs> live um, um, post-production whatever it was very hard to get uh, advertising revenue I take it from that period onwards is it oh yeah yeah because um, most of the the market well 50% of the market was outside of Ireland and uh, when I would go to somebody would you sponsor this program or they advertise on it and the next enough they're gonna ask who's gonna see it and you would explain at that time there's over nearly 220 countries now would view what we do but at that time there would have been probably 60 or 70 countries um, through diaspora connections but um, somebody would say well, sure, what good is that person um, if they're in Australia or America to us as a business in locally 
But um, what they didn't realise was that um, there was, a, and I had a developer methodology of persuading them that if you had a parent still at home and they were earning money out in Australia or, or bring them um, a washing machine or a, something as a present from the local supplier. And the local suppliers, most of them would either have emails or something. So you could just email the local supplier and say, send me mother out a washing machine or something or a fridge or any a box of chocolates or yeah. a vertical card. So it was it was developing the methodology around the feedback. All right, yeah. So for the USB, let's say for you, over terrestrial TV, for web TV, it's like bringing the local global, would it be? Like, in other words, covering stuff that... Uh, regular terrestrial channels we can cover, especially in regional areas in Ireland. Is oh yeah, yeah, well the the, the, the programming, um, people indicate, oh you're not getting enough local content um, to sustain the thing, but we proved that, that you can get local content. Um, we had two music programs, we had uh, two sports programs, we had a business program and uh, a news program, and it, it meant that um, both um, on the musical scene, we had a, a country one, which is very, very popular in rural Ireland, not necessarily in in, um, in the urban areas. And then the the sports one, we had a dedicated GA one, which is again almost as popular in Ireland as the country music. And then we had other sports, even John Delaney, um, that's on the news today. We had exclusive interviews with him, and he gave us information that that he held back even from the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. You're quite passionate about what you do, which is why you're in on the show, on the Power Dreams, because we like to see what people are doing around Ireland. And for you as a person, you're also involved in something which is pivotal, which is helping other people, not just in Irish Web TV, but you're also part of Positive Age. How did you get involved in that? And listen here, we want to hear about Amsterdam, because you took 40 <laughs> people away. Yeah, how many came Tell back? Tell us everything. <laughs> yeah, how many came back? Um, well, again, I got, in, I got involved in Positive Age primarily because of, of my, my techie interest, because um, they'd asked me to take photographs and record videos of all the events that they were doing. Um, that was um, in 1990, believe it or not. And um, then we started a foreign trip to bring older people abroad because at that time in 1996 people didn't have the access to, to travel, the cost was very high. So we, um, as an organisation we set about bringing people to, to different parts of Europe. Brilliant. And how did it go for you? Because I remember tuning into Facebook and now this whole live stream is kicking off on Facebook. You can go and live stream. So you were doing that from venues all over Amsterdam and it looked like it was great fun. Is this something very rewarding to you as a person, personally? Oh, well, it is, yeah, because um, everyone has certain qualities and time being one of them. And if when your time is your own, you can make a decision like your pay is your own because the government takes this out and that out and the other out of it but your time is your own so you can decide I'm going to give this amount of time to this and, and that amount of time to that so um, I made the decision that yeah I, I enjoy doing that I like taking photographs um, older people um, they appreciate it you see the smiles on the face you bring them to places that that, um, that that they only dreamt about or maybe saw on television or in the in the, the movies and like, their face light up as if as if like a child in a, in a sweet shop well in amsterdam i'm sure there's a lot of faces lighting up definitely but listen also what happens next with you when it comes to irish web tv how do you bring it to that next step what would you like to see happening as well um, well irish web tv um would have an, a, a national network and and we have some um, European ones as well. Um, everything is moving towards the likes of web TV because the cost of production. Um, I spoke to, or you spoke to, um, what do you call the, the, the gentleman in RT that yes. was involved at, at the yeah. MojoCon. MojoCon, yeah. And he was saying that 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 they were still thinking of buying cameras at sixty thousand euro, whereas um, even four K cameras, which is the the, the new um, standard now. Um, to buy those, it's only about five or six thousand to buy, um, and even some of the newer mobile phones, which that conference was about, can give the same quality. So the the, the cost of production is 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 has gone down by maybe down to one tenth of what it used to be. So it means that more um, locally established things can take place. That that um, uh, an area or a community that that maybe have 
um, a bit of deprivation could bring those people in and set up their own TV station and um, it means that there's a great buy-in from those. So it means that, that uh, from a community involvement it's a great asset. Um, so it means that, that people see that, that, that they can get involved, like they used to say, I oh, get people involved in sports, why not get involved in TV or even radio? I agree because I think it's social media and the way that the generations that are moving up the ranks at the moment communicate is through a very visual a very, um, you know, what, what you are doing, it has to be very based on social media and also camera work and um, recorded essence. So you're connecting now with a new generation of people as well. And I do think it might be the new communities that we're molding in Ireland. So rather than reject them, I think what you're doing is you're saying, let's communicate, let's create these new cyber communities and um, share the old school stuff. You know what's going on like you do you do so many programs going from like you say country and western to local events and i think you know at the heart and soul of irish people we like to know what's going on whether we're in australia or america our heart and soul is rooted where we come from and i think what you're doing is absolutely beautiful and amazing and it's inspirational so thank you so much for talking to us about it Thank you, Marion. I hope to see you again. And please, God, listen, guys, will you just support this? Because Irish Web TV are doing their best. And just Google, go straight online, check it out, see what's going on. And, you know, make a comment if you can to Brian himself. And um, if we support each other, it'll make sense. Oh, this is so cool. Yay, you did it. It's over. That was brilliant. No, no, I don't do this type of thing, you know. <laughs> I'm more in there. Are well, that's why I asked you. you. We'll bring you back to the second half showing off to <laughs> <laughs> That was great. You did really well. Thank you so for yeah, <coughs> that's the key thing. I mean, you're doing it from your heart. Like we're I'll all just doing. Check with my GP now to see yeah, what, what extra. Check there. his pulse I'm there. Not. Uh, not do, you're not going to Amsterdam anyway. That's for sure. <laughs> not anymore. No, <laughs> no, you will. You will. Brilliant stuff. It's brilliant. Okay. Um, will I leave or something? Or? Well, you can chill here with us, trying to get a cup of tea, or you can just sit in. There's no problem. If oh, possible, it'd be great to have you stay because a couple of things I'd like to ask you. Yeah. I think what you did was fucking brilliant and it opens yeah. up the whole conversation. So yeah, I was thinking okay the same. Yeah, 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 no, no, I, I was hoping I'm you would say. Free no. For the day, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not happy. Free. I didn't send in <laughs> <laughs> did you tell your boss, you're right? Because this is why I thought there would be a great synergy. Yeah, there's questions you I'd know? like to ask that maybe the listener might be interested in. So it's okay. Oh, all right, right. Just just, be great. Yeah. And I also think there's a new medium here. There's, there's this connectivity there if we stop pocketing. So your grand grand going for an adult, he's going straight to an adult. So. Well, live stream was the only one that, that or you stream was the only one that you go live to the to the web. And um, now um, Facebook are doing it, Twitter are starting to do it, um, YouTube now have the YouTube live. So yeah. I could put, put a multi camera feed out on, on YouTube yeah. or a multi camera feed out on, also, on Facebook. And yeah. somebody that, that may be organising small events, they have their own Facebook and, and they can get yeah. as good a... Like you could have live aid in other words. Yeah. Mm. Did, uh, and also his movie, his film. I mean, theirs gets out to the diaspora but he, as well. But I think the film's something different, but the idea of community and the idea of community yeah. not driven by a conglomerate or not driven by yeah. a controller... Yeah. Is, is, is control it's kind of like yeah. citizens. Yeah. You know, yeah. journalism or media now, it's gone citizen journalism, yeah. where yeah. if you have an Absolutely. iPhone, you, well, you're on yeah. site. So the that's Maverick That's kind of like citizen yeah. TV stations. Yeah, yeah, the Mavericks. Yeah. We break uh, the mold. And it's interesting because there's, there's two generations who are not picking up on that because they don't have the precedent that we have. They don't have terrestrial television or that... that functioning reductive world that we understood as BBC or television or RT or whatever and they don't seem to understand the power they have the extraordinary power to reach a profound audience in the shortest time frame. yeah yeah, yeah the, um, while, while Facebook like, everyone's using it now but they're using it almost like you're nearly using old terrestrial television in a way that, that mm. it's sort yeah. of still images yeah whereas it, it can yeah. give power yeah. to people I don't mean in the wrong sense no but, um, that they can engage in it's, it's a level of communication that we had to advance yeah. to because we can't sit yeah. back with old school but also they bring core values old values yeah. forward yeah. but meeting and, and cyberspace motion and everything and, and yeah. um, i know you see a lot of stuff on facebook but they're shaky cameras and everything type of thing but um like that you can put in multi cameras into facebook yeah so mm. you could have like a and um I'm always conscious of somebody saying you've only a second or so. <laughs> no, you're grand when he does this. That's after this. That's break. break. Now you some. I was going to say an awful chat. Well, you did the in the air thing, so it was easier to talk to the presenter. Yeah. 
February. Um, Shall we, we, did a, we did a, a thing um, a couple of years ago that, that wasn't picked up on by the charities and that I had five simultaneous events in Ireland. One, oh, one two was outside of Ireland um, that I was able to... It was a music thing for a charity. There, there was a pub in Dublin, one in Cavan, one in, um, in Northern Ireland and one in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. And I was able to call all those up individually on the screen and yeah. switch to them yeah. when required. Yeah. There were at, so it was, it was almost like a live aid um, on a virtual concert, like a live aid only cyber cyber aid. Yeah, yeah one minute, guys. Right, I'm going to intro back into introduce Terry, and then we'll have a conversation continuing on from Brian. Keeping you in studio, chat. You're back with us in studio. This is the power of dreams. Um, we have Brian Daly in studio talking to us about Irish Web TV and Mr. Terry McMahon. You know something? I feel there's like a real connectivity going on today. So there's a few questions. Terry, following on the back of the conversation we've had with Brian, what do you think? Let's, let's see your thoughts on um, Irish Web TV and the whole world that he's involved in. We were just talking about there about the idea of community. What does community mean? And what does the idea of accessing communal power mean? Most of television and most of the things that we engage with are controlled by conglomerates. They're controlled by somebody who wants it to function as a way of getting money from you for whatever source possible. The idea of putting together something that is purely altruistic is profound because a community can get together and you can have a fundraising event. And that fundraising event can be streamed live and people can respond live and put money live into an account. But there's no intermediary, there's no controller, there's nobody skimming off the top or robbing everything. And it means that communities are building communities based on the idea of what television used to be, which is a communal experience. And there's no better form to do it with right now than what you're doing. It's profoundly filled with the possibility of a humanistic, empowering power. Well, that's exactly what we did in Derry. Brian, fill him in on the live stream you did for the children in Crossfire. Funny enough, that was Richard Moore's charity and also the Dalai Lama was part of that. And uh, we live streamed for three days from Derry for that exact purpose, to raise funds. There was nobody stepping in the middle of it and every cent went back direct. And I think you're, you're so right, Terry, because this can make a massive, massive difference to how we, we communicate and the communities that we need to reform somehow in Ireland. Yeah, Marion dragged uh, our production company <laughs> off to Derry one weekend. She said, Brian, we're, we're live streaming in Derry. And as it turned out to be a fantastic event because you can understand the Dalai Lama was there. And um, Marion um, is unique uh, when you look at some of the, the information. She actually hugged the Dalai Lama and there's over 45,000 views um, <laughs> on YouTube and in 51 countries, Marion. Oh, but, but the primary purpose of that was to, to, to showcase um, the children in Crossfire. And um, that's a charity um, run by... Um, Richard Moore. Richard Moore, who, who was blinded by... Um, uh, a rubber bullet a rubber when bullet. he was 10 coming out of school. And as a result of it, it changed him so much. Um, or maybe he didn't. Maybe he was always going to be this person, but he made a decision very young that he was going to come back, make a difference. And then the Dalai Lama somehow got involved in this process as well, and they're very, very good friends. So, I mean, it, it goes to prove a point that, you know, good things happen and that anything is possible if you believe in it as well. And that's why we're here today. It's about the power of dreams. And there's a purpose behind everything we do. And I do agree with you, Jerry, that um, we need to find a way forward. And, and it's a beautiful, altruistic thing when somebody can dedicate their life and their finances to what you're doing, Brian, which is fantastic. But you're in the same boat too, Terry. You're, you're putting your passion and your love and your time into what you love as well and to make a difference because your latest film, Patrick's Day, has been just uh, revered around the globe. And um, I personally was very lucky to see it and I am profoundly affected by it. You were saying something there earlier about the audience, the impact it has on people. What, what are you seeing at the moment when the film finishes and people in the audience are there and... Well, we were talking earlier about the idea of what cinema has become and similar to television. Unfortunately, cinema has been corralled and funneled into one functionary form, which is to generate cash. But there are still people who go to a dark room and have a collective experience that is transformative. And Patrick's Day, for whatever reason, has screened again and again in rooms where people 
afterwards, when the lights come up, they begin to speak about the most profoundly private elements of their life, many times never having spoken about it in public before. And it becomes that cathartic release that you hope cinema is for. And we had a screening two weeks ago in Limerick for the World Mental Health Day in the bell table. And again, it was one of those scenarios where you watch a bunch of strangers have a collective experience so remarkable that they end up crying and hugging each other at the end. And despite the fact that making films is a nightmare financially, the payoff to watch those strangers do that is lifelong. Isn't that why you do what you do? For you as a person, for you in your soul? Your passion isn't just, it, there's no way, you know, I know we have a little bit of ego in us and we all like the acclaim. We like, we like getting feedback, a positive feedback, but somewhere in the core of you, a lot of the, the essence of what you do has always been about others as well. You're, like Even the clips I've seen of you working and interacting with your crew and with the people that work on the films, you're very um, grounded and very kind and um, very considerate. And I think that's probably what is coming and translating into your works as well. So, Patrick, say, I'm not surprised. It's an absolutely beautiful piece, but I have to say credit to you, all credit to you, because when you put that energy as a person in, it's beautiful to see it come back again. Um, before this, also, you started a journey. You got a bus from Mullingar as a young fella up to Dublin City, and that changed your life. It wasn't a bus, it was thumbing a lift. Oh, you were thumbing, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very like, like kind of what you say, but I need to make movies to get laid, so... That's, oh! That's, that's, <laughs> that's for all the people out there, <laughs> listening in. I thumbed a lift from Mullingar to Dublin, and that, this is... 85, I think, was the year, and this is one of those scenarios where, at that time, similarly to what Brian was talking about, how things have changed in a short few decades, Dublin seemed to be the other end of the world. And I couldn't get out of that parochial town fast enough. I hated everything about it. And then later you realize that you're the one who is seeing the town wrong, but that takes a while. And I came to Dublin and I was homeless for a while and I went through all that process of becoming the equivalent of a ghost in your own life and realizing that if you don't do something right now, you probably won't see tomorrow. And then there's a part of you that wants to put a noose around your neck and there's another part of you that's terrified of it. And you have to balance the two and decide that perhaps there's a different possibility for a different future. So I went to a bookie's office and robbed a pencil and a piece of paper and began to write what became my first screenplay. Wow. <clears throat> that's a good start. Park. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Charlie Casanova was your first movie. But just get, getting back to, I mean, Patrick's Day particularly fascinates me because you worked, you worked as a trainee here in a psychiatric hospital, and the one thing I, f I found that you said that were found particularly interesting was that you witnessed fa parents with 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 uh, with kids or whatever, and they were they were warm and loving, but you, w when it came to any way of expressing their intimacy or love, they immediately the the, the block came or the, the the shutter came down. I mean, like, you, how, how did you find like you witnessed that a lot? Like, did you? I remember in, in that particular hospital, and I won't name it simply out of courtesy to mm -hmm. the staff, because many of them were wonderful people, but many of the other staff were not malicious. They believed what they were doing is right. Mm. And what happened was they used me as kind of a guinea pig, because I was, I think I was 17 at the time, or 18, and it was the equivalent of a FOSS course, which was like a training, supposedly training course. And they put me on the female ward after a month on the male ward, and I was the first male who had ever been put on the female ward. And literally there was a red tape on the ground, stuck to the ground, and I was told I could not cross that line. Now I was a teenager and I was terrified, but I thought I cannot allow this, so I immediately stepped across that line. Half the staff went into the office, insisted I be fired, and insisted I be removed, the other half were incredibly supportive. And I still didn't know what to do, and it's one of those things where it's the back to that extremity of having to make a choice. And there was an old record player there, and I put on the record player, and there was a Beatles song, a slow Beatles song. And there was a woman there who used to dress in these incredibly old-style dresses. And she was profoundly vulnerable and shy, but also perhaps yearning for a kind of intimacy that was not sexual. So I extended my hand and she took my hand and we started to dance. And Whoa. half the staff were psychotic and the other half thought it was beautiful. And that became the scenario for a month in there. And time and again you saw not just the parents, but also the staff have this moral presumption of authority 
where their idea of what is appropriate and inappropriate was more important than the dehumanization or humanization of that person. So that's where Patrick's Day came from, the original seat. Sounds like a real Shawshank Redemption moment when you put on the record, you know what I mean? It's that, 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 that there is beauty outside these four walls, if you know what I mean. It's well, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even intended to be orchestrated. I was terrified doing it, so I'm not going to mm. pretend it was an heroic act. It yeah. wasn't. But it was one of those scenarios where, again, you go, this is a moment where your cowardice or your refusal to be a coward will define what happens next. And despite the fact that you're utterly terrified, it's still not an excuse to be a coward. Mm -hmm. You've stuck with that, though, as well. You're, you're very brave. You're not afraid to speak your voice in so many aspects of your life. Um, did you always have that sense in yourself? Was that one of the decisions when you left Mullingar, that there was a part of you that wanted more, that needed more, and wanted to explore life? Uh, in, in Mullingar, I was a, an awkward, shy... Uh, I, my, my legs were all messed up from when I was a kid, so I had to wear special shoes. I had a bad stammer, so it was like forest gum territory, for Christ's sake. Mm. <laughs> but born out of that, you realize that, and this was a terrible need to fit in. This was not, this was not some heroic independence. It was the opposite. It was a, an, a, a subversion of pain and loneliness to try and find a way into people. And once you start selling out your innate characteristics, people, of course, understandably reject you because they recognize the fallacy of who you are. And that begins the journey of discovering who you might become. Well, where are you now with everything? What would you like to see happening with Patrick's Day? Or is there another script waiting to go? I'm trying to write a script at the moment, but um, again, it's, you know, we exist in a, in a profoundly disturbing time. We exist in a culture where we have scum and government defining our destiny. They don't give a damn about people with mental health issues. They don't give a damn about the elderly. They don't give a damn about anybody except themselves or some corporate master that they seem to be answering to. And that is the gauntlet thrown down to all of us. How can we take the time we're living in and do something about it to such a degree that our grandkids, if they ask us, what did you do during the centenary of 2016? You don't answer, I was a coward and I did nothing. So I'm trying to write a script that deals with the disenfranchisement of the working class and the corruption of the controlling class. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the key, guys, anybody listening in. This is the power of dreams. The reason why we are here today is to make a difference. And you know what? We can take on the powers because we have a voice. And no matter what, even for an hour on a Wednesday, we have a voice. And Terry certainly has a voice, and so does Brian. Dean. You're listening to the power of dreams here in Dublin, South FM, with Marion and Porrick. And we have our special guest today, Terry McMahon, the filmmaker. Just return to that, uh, just Terry about the movie St. Saint, Saint Patrick's Day. Kerry Fox was the, the lead actress in it. As we know Kerry Fox from the past, she was in Shallow Grave and a number of big movies. Um, how, how did you land her? It's a very ambiguous way for you. <laughs> <laughs> I did not land her. No. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. How did you get her to have a role in your movie <laughs> then, to be more precise? <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd first seen Kerry Fox in Jane Campion's film, An Angel at My Table. Mm. I don't know if your listeners have ever seen it, but try and get it your hands on it if you can. It's about Janet Frame, the writer who ended up in an asylum. A masterpiece of a film. And I had seen it over 20 years earlier. And the casting director of Patrick's Day is a wonderful woman called Rebecca Roper. And I said to Rebecca, what are the chances of us getting a Kerry Fox type? Because I knew there's no way we could get the actual Kerry Fox. And Rebecca said, if you write a letter, I can get it to her agent. So I wrote a letter, and within 24 hours, Kerry Fox said, can you come to London? I went to her house, terrified, and uh, spent the day with her, going through line by line the entire script. And for a tiny sum of money in comparative terms, she said that she'd be honored to be a part of it. And it happened that fast. And it was the same with Philip Jackson, who plays the cop, another, for me, a heroic actor. And then you have the other side, which is a complete unknowns, like Mo Dunford. The lead, inspired the choice. Lead. Well, it's interesting, because he's inspired retrospectively. And he's won the Berlin Film Festival Award and all kinds of stuff. But at the time, Mo Dunford was completely unknown. And when you have financiers who are trying to push, there was a kid who was quite famous at the time. Mm. Still is, but they wanted him for the role. And the reason they wanted him for the role makes sense, because he is a viable commercial possibility. I met with him a few times, and I knew that there was nothing in him that was broken. He was uh, beautiful and accustomed to being found beautiful. He had been in a gym for three hours a day for the last ten years. He'd never missed a meal a day in his life and had no idea what it meant to be lonely. 
and I knew that to fake that was not going to work. But this kid came in called Mo Dunford, who looked like he had come from an all-night party. But the difference was he knew all the text. He had made choices. And we were going to go with a guy called Aaron Monaghan, who's one of the great actors in the world, with the financial says we can't get it financed with him. So I said, find me somebody 50% as good as Aaron Monaghan, or I'm pulling the plug on the film, and I'm shooting it on my phone. Now, when you make a film like Charlie Casanova, and you threaten somebody to film it on your phone, the morons think you're being serious, when in actuality you're just playing poker. But they went for it, and they said, okay, who do you want? I said, bring back one guy called Mo Dunford. And they went, who? And what they didn't know is that myself and I have been communicating privately for a couple of weeks, and I've been taking him through the script scene by scene, and I've been rehearsing with him. So he came back for the call back. The finance, or the producer and the cast and director were afraid the film was falling asunder. Nobody had any idea what was happening, and Mo Dunford came in, and he did a remarkable audition. But one of the financiers was still not happy with him. Not through any fault of their own, but they said, can he be soft? And I had no idea what that meant. So I said, OK, you're coming home with me. And Ireland were playing a game. <coughs> Excuse me. Ireland were playing a game that night. And a couple of friends of mine were around for a couple of beers. And Mo was only 24 at the time. And this guy was bringing him home to his house. And poor Mo had no idea what the hell was going to happen. <laughs> we brought him home. We got him drunk. And I had this beautiful border collie Labrador mix called Willow, who's a complete whore, frankly, <laughs> but a beautiful dog. And I rubbed ham on the side of Mo's face, and I asked him, did he remember the text from the scene? He says, yeah. I says, okay, start saying it. I let the dog in, the dog jumped on the couch, started licking the side of his face where the ham was, and he was telling her the lines from the film. I filmed it on my phone, sent it into the financiers, and I says, yeah, let's go with him. So in the end, a dog cast him. <laughs> wow. And it, it, yeah, the, the thing you saw in him was like the broken vulnerability, I think, wasn't it? Or, the, or you described it as the man child, no? Yeah, but I think someone like Mo Dunford is a remarkably precocious human being on multiple levels for a young man, but he's also a, a, a child. There's still that child in him. And then when you discover his own background, which I had privately known after conversation, and he's publicly stated it, so this, I'm not being indiscreet here, but his own brother was diagnosed as being schizophrenic. So he has an insight that even psychiatrists wouldn't have. He's a first-hand knowledge and an experiential knowledge that he was able to apply. And then he also had a bravery and a courage and a willingness to go to the places where I needed him to go. And he ended up being the most remarkable performer we could possibly get. And now he's on an international career, which is fantastic for him. Yeah. Well, it's it's very obvious in the movie because when he does go there in character, you completely forget where you are because he is totally in it. And there's, there's a level of communication of, of his personality that you think to yourself, this guy must have the knowledge within his soul, within his heart. And that's the one thing about the movie is it, it's very, very believable. But I also think that, you know, for us today, it's a movie that I think a lot of people should really go out and support and everybody listening at the moment. This is a pivotal movie in my psyche and I certainly think it's going to affect a lot of people in a positive way. And if you find that this is something that's affecting you or that you've been considering change in your life in a positive way, this is a groundbreaking movie that I recommend you go and find out more about and also ask for help. That's the big key thing as well because the way that Terry has done it, it is communicating a message and the message is one really, really genuinely of hope and that's why we're doing what we're doing and I think everybody in this room today is on a, on a mission and it's not just a singular mission, it's also to make sure that you listening today get some help and also reach out because there's a scene in the movie in particular that I just keep going back to and uh, my heart breaks every single time and uh, I'm not going to say what it is but there's pivotal points in this movie that would change the way you look at life in a good way even the hardest points in it make a difference and um, Terry is there a point in all of this that you say well done to yourself and take credit for what you've done do you actually sit back and say wow I'm so proud of myself for this no and it's not false modesty but it's not about me and if you make it be about you that's a problem yeah if you're doing it for a career to get later get richer get famous or get whatever there are infinitely easier ways of doing all three but if you're doing it for somebody else to empower somebody <coughs> in the darkness the way Kerry Fox's movie, An Angel at My Table, empowered me when I was sitting in the bedside. That's what you're looking for. And you're never going to meet that person. You're never going to 
connect with that person. And yet the internet, like Brian was talking about earlier, has opened it up to such a degree that we literally have received hundreds and hundreds of emails from complete strangers saying that the film affected them in such a profoundly personal way that they felt empowered to take that courageous step toward hope or courage that they never had before. Well, I'm going to say well done. And I'm going to pat you on the back. Thanks, Mom. And that's allowed. Yeah, you're, you're OK, son. <laughs> Good start in studio. Mm. Oh, yeah, just as regards you personally, you've, 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 you've shared your own personal experiences and how uh, you've went through a period where your house, the financial security of your family and your house being under threat. Like, I did, I did a documentary uh, uh, called Debt to His Parent. I found very, one very interesting thing about it was uh, I thought the women who fell into financial difficulty tend to be very proactive, whereas the men were anonymous in my documentary. And I felt there was a great, with Irish men, there's a great, there was a great sense of shame or failure, sense of failure, like being the hunter-gatherer that they'd let the, the family down. Like, and I found with them that they'd become disconnected from society and that. With you, did, did, did you, did it, did you, did you it inform your work, like, if you know, rather than take away from it, if you know what I mean? Well, there's two things, is that the idea of making something, especially a film, it is such a, an act of optimism. It's ridiculous. It's impossible to make a film from a selfish point of view because it will fail immediately. But the second thing is that if you define that film in relation to yourself, you're already missing the world of possibility from a collaborative collective. And when I look at Patrick's Day, it's not something that I feel like I have achieved. It's something that I feel a whole bunch of people have contributed remarkable work to. And the combination of all of those people is what makes it. And again, that's not false modesty. It's a simple fact. But in terms of my home and the reality of banks and so on and so forth, that's still the same scenario. In terms of the emasculation of an individual or the emasculation of an entire society of men, I think that's an ongoing process that's, that's yielding remarkable power and remarkable disempowerment simultaneously. And it's going to have to, unfortunately, tip the balance toward disempowerment before it returns to equality. But the idea of using your own personal courage I had no interest in talking about any of this before, <coughs> excuse me, before Patrick's Day. And the reason being is that, for me, it was a private conversation. But when you make a film uh, that's hopefully going to attempt to give people the empowerment to be courageous, you can't sit back and go, well, that's just for you. My private story is secondary or irrelevant. So you, you have to show the same courage <coughs> and go toward talking about your own fear, your own doubt, your own darkness, your own loneliness. And only through that can somebody feel, okay, they've put themselves on the line, we have to do the same. So you're, maybe you're, what you've gone through now at this stage is probably raw material for a script maybe you could write in the near future, which, uh, uh, which uh, I tell you, a lot of families around this country could connect with. The, well, there's two things, that the families who can connect with that don't go to the cinema, because they can't afford to go to the cinema, they can't even afford to put breakfast on the table. And again, we, there's a whole subculture of people from all classes who are living in this culture right now who are ghosts in their own lives and have been completely dismissed and forgotten and deliberately thrown in the trash can by the system that we're living in. Is there a film within them? Yes. I Am Daniel, Ken Loach's new film, is connecting on a visceral level with that, but that's an 80-year-old filmmaker with an extraordinary track record. We exist in a time when we don't make political films. Charlie Casanova was the first political film that had come out of that pre collapse era and it was destroyed. Patrick's Day is addressing the same idea which is about revisionism and disenfranchisement and the, uh, the deliberate erasure of memory. We don't make political films in this country. I don't know why and it breaks my heart because we used to but there were, those films were about Northern Ireland. Now we have not, in, in our time frame when it comes to the Celtic Tiger and the corruption that has amassed around it, Ortiz's most successful program was Love Hate mm -hmm. which is a program about how the working class are the ones to be feared. And that, to me, is a manifestation of everything that is disturbing. Regardless of how effective Love Hate was as a drama, which I completely admire, but in terms of the politics of the decision-making process, where the hell are our political filmmakers? Where are our Ken Loaches? The thing about Love Hate, I suppose, is from a middle-class point of view, it's kind of a separate thing, you know, an escapism from it, or, you know, it's something we can look at, look on, rather but, than... But also, in Love Hate, all the middle class are victims, mm. and all the scum are working class, when in actuality, it was the controlling class who were destroying the working class. Mm -hmm. 
I have to put my hands up. I've never seen it, so I'd love to say. But it's something I've actually not was watched terrestrial television for about three years, simply because I just wanted to embrace something other than what was on the screens in front of me and live a life. And I think that's the key as well, is that, the, and also financially, I went through a change as well in my own life. And I, as you say, there are certain things that you don't have access to in your life, circumstances change as well, and you make decisions about priorities. And I'm sure there are people listening in today that genuinely are connecting to what we're talking about because really what we're here for is to open doors to make you consciously make decisions about what's good for you in your own lives and maybe something Terry has said or Brian has said or Park has said or something I've said today is going to make a difference to you and look if you need any help if there's something going on mentally physically emotionally spiritually guys there's hope there's certainly hope out there and whatever medium it's brought to you to trigger that catalyst within your soul embrace it and reach out because that's the key here as well. It's very important. You're listening to the Power of Dreams here in Dublin, South Africa, with Marion and Porrick, and we're especially guest today is uh, Terry McMahon, the filmmaker with the movie St. Patrick's Day. Just uh, Terry, just uh, your, your movies are with uh, Charlie Casanova and St. Patrick's Day. There's a political tone to them generally, but you you talk about with St. Patrick's Day the de deconstruction of the mammy state. Could you just explain that. Well, the idea behind. Patrick's Day is that a mother who believes that what she's doing is beneficial to her child, despite the fact that the horrors and consequence of her actions are clearly evident to her. So if you conceive of the notion of the implementation of the policies of austerity that our government are applying, utterly convincing themselves that somehow it is the only inevitable application to the benefit of the country, despite the absolute horror of the consequence of it. That's a very political metaphor that's obvious in the film. If you conceive of our ex-leader of the Labour Party being in court where a 17-year-old boy is found guilty of imprisoning her in a car as she smiles on her phone, that's a complete delusion of the idea of consequence and victimhood and who is the victim and who is the aggressor. So as a political metaphor and as a human story, our capacity for revisionism seems to know no bounds and our willingness to acquiesce in our own demise is sadly so evident on every level. And Patrick's Day is an ab reaction to that. Mm. Now, you hit a very interesting point there before the break. You talked about, I talked about maybe making a movie about your experiences, but you said a lot of people who have those experiences wouldn't even be able to afford to go to the cinema or a night out. And so there's, you were, there's a, a hidden Ireland out there, really, is it? It's not even that they wouldn't be able to afford it, it's that in their life, yeah. they can't even begin to consider the idea of art or communal engagement when they're caught in an invisible prison, mm -hmm. an orchestrated invisible prison. And yes, there's a hidden Ireland, and it's not class-based. Unfortunately, it's everywhere, where there are people who are walking around in a apparently new suit or new dress, but there's an empty fridge at home. Yeah. And this notion of trying to keep appearances despite the fact that they're dying in sight now, again, this can apply to anybody. And Mariam was talking earlier about the idea of reaching out. Sometimes you reach out and nobody gives a damn. Sometimes you turn to somebody close to you, someone in your family, and you try to hint to them that you're close to the edge. And they don't give a damn, not through any act of malice, but because they themselves are close to the edge, and the last thing they can do is address it in you. So the idea of reaching out sometimes requires the courage to reach in and go, today is the day I won't take it anymore. Not in a nihilistic way, not in a fatalistic way, but in a progressive, opportunistic way where you decide no matter what happens, today is going to change. No matter what happens, if it's going into a bookies and stealing a pencil and a piece of paper and beginning to write your story, that could be the beginning of a movie from you. You don't need to have screenplay education. I had no education. I left school at 15. I didn't go to college. I didn't finish secondary school. I've won awards all over the world as a screenwriter. Does that mean anything? No, all that matters is the words on the page followed by a full stop, followed by a paragraph, followed by an act of completion. Everybody out there has that capacity, so they should tell their story because there's so many who want to hear it. Mm. And, do you, do you, like, this is a... I suppose we, we had the mother of all recessions and we're still coming out of uh, ground zero, more or less. You know, as you say, there's still a people who are still... They, they talk about green shoots and all that crap, like, there's still a lot of people suffering. But they say art, supposedly, flourishes in times of economic... Uh, uncertainty. Do you find a lot of other? Do you see a lot of young writers coming up now that that make you excited? Um, I think it's a nonsense to suggest that art flourishes under economic repression. 
nor do I think we had a recession. I think we had an orchestrated smash and grab. But in terms of young writers, I wish young writers would have the courage to accept that there is something beyond science fiction, there is something beyond bland comedy, there is something beyond action movies and guns, that there are human stories that still have the capacity to teach and to provoke and to open up conversations that you yourself may not have the courage to provoke in another through your mouth, but you might be able to provoke through your work. That's not based on age. So you can be a young writer and be 70 years of age. You're young because it's the first time you're going to put that pencil to that page. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, and uh, even here, the connection here with Brian as a guy in Irish Web TV, I mean, you're talking about, I'm sorry, sorry for bringing up the idea of Hidden Ireland, but there is a big Hidden Ireland out there. And to give, he's part of the solution as a guy that's given it a voice. Please don't apologize for bringing it up. Why the hell should we not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the people listen to this. Yeah, this is opening doors. This is making a difference. And um, we have two people in the studio here, Brian Daly from Irish Web TV and Mr. Terry McMahon, who are pivotal in making the change because it's the honesty of what you do, isn't it? It's the courage. It's the fearlessness that you have something there that you are offering to people that make a difference. And I think one thing you just said that is just, again, opening up my education on a psychic level as well, is that you said to reach in and then you can reach out. And I think you're right. Find a way of reaching into that place, that survival mode, that, that place that grounds you, that place that makes you grow and make a choice about your life. Because you are enough. You are worth it. And, and everything about you as a person, I'm talking to you listening right now, you're a valid, precious soul, and you matter and make a difference. And we're very lucky. I wish we could go on forever, guys, because um, this is only an hour show. But, I mean, we will have you back, Terry, uh, on Scott and, and Brian as well, because these are... These are mediums for people to express their souls and to help others. And that's what we're here for today as well. It's very important. That's why the power of dream is happening. Because what can happen is that you can achieve anything if you reach in. And that's the key thing as well. And I love that. I absolutely love that phrase as well. Um, I think it's very important to say that as well, that what you will experience in your life will knock you to the ground, but you'll get back up again. And that's the key. It's very important. Okay, Terry, thank you so much for being in studio with us. I really appreciate your input. And we're very excited. Patrick's Day is amazing, but also any, anybody out there, go and look at his earlier stuff as well. It's amazing, absolutely amazing, the journey. Same as Irish Web TV, Brian Daly. I hope people Google and they check out all the work you've put into this and the passion that you've put behind it as well. Such energy in studio today. It's absolutely beautiful. I have to say, um, I wish we had more time. I really genuinely do, because we have to talk about these subjects. We've been very gentle today, but there are some serious issues going on in this country that are affecting us so directly. And I'm looking forward to opening a can of worms whenever that happens in the future as well, in a very nice way, of course. Guys, thank you so much for coming in, Mr. Brian Daly. Thank you, Marion and Dublin South FM. Oh, you're much, much welcome here any time. And Terry McMahon, fabulous darling. Great to have you in the studio. Thank you for being here. Porik, what do you think? We Great did show. all right. Great show, absolutely. We yeah. survived yeah, another yeah. day. Right, guys, we'll see you next Wednesday. Coming up after us is The Bow Show. Thank you for listening. Share, share, share.